So beginning at verse 13, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, Paul writes, We are bound to give thanks to God always for you, brethren, beloved by the Lord, because God from the beginning chose you for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth to which he called you by our gospel for the obtaining of the glory of the, our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which you were taught, whether by word or our epistle. Now, may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and our God and Father, who has loved us and given us etern everlasting consolation and good hope by grace, comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. And so Paul is beginning this portion by saying, I am obligated, I am bound, I am obligated to give thanks for you. Now, this is the second time he's used that phrase. This is the second time he says that he's obligated. In chapter 1 and verse 3, he had said that he was obligated to give thanks for them, and he gave us three reasons, three reasons why he felt bound by God to say thank you for these people. First, he gave thanks because their faith, he said, was, a gr was growing exceedingly. And secondly, he gave thanks because their love for each other was abounding. And then third, uh, he gave thanks because they were exhibiting great patience in the face of persecution. Faith, love, and patience. And he was thanking God for these things. Now, why would he be thanking God for that? Why would he be obligated to say, thank you, God, for these people? Well, they're going through difficulties. They're going through tribulation and affliction. They're going through hard times. And when people encounter difficulties, very often the very first thing they do, or at least are tempted to do, is to turn away from the Lord. Sometimes the difficulties are too much for them to handle, and sometimes their faith simply runs dry. But that wasn't true with this church. In the midst of the trials that they're experiencing, they're continuing to exhibit faith, and they're showing love and patience. And this is something that moved him to thank God for. So he says in verse 13, he says, We are bound to give thanks to God always for you, brethren, beloved by the Lord. We are bound to, we are, we are obligated to, because you have believed the truth. And that's why I'm thanking God. You said you are, you are beloved by the Lord. God from the beginning chose you for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and belief, he says, in the truth. You have believed the truth of the gospel. And in believing the truth of the gospel, you will not believe the lie that Antichrist is bringing. Now remember in verse 10 of the same chapter, he had said, with all unrighteous deception among, among those who perish, he said, because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. They did not receive the love of the truth. They refused to receive the love of the truth. In the last days, when Antichrist is, is, a, is making his appearance on, on planet Earth, there will be those who are refusing to hear the message. And that speaks of the truth being offered to them, and they're refusing to receive it. So when they hear something they disagree with, they are, they, are, they are going to just simply reject it. We see that today. One of the things I was speaking to uh, one of my grandchildren the other day, and just for a moment, it was, it was not a deep conversation with Grandpa by any means, but it was just a simple conversation for just a moment, and I was pointing out a simple thing, and that was that this generation, the younger generation, has been, has been groomed to reject history. They don't like history. They don't want to hear about it. it just it, what, what does history got to do with me? And I was sharing with them that uh, those who, who uh, uh, forget history are doomed to repeat it. You're supposed to learn from the things that occurred in the past in order that you can make sure that you're, you're not going to fall for the same thing. But because people today are rejecting history, they think it's not something relevant to them, they're open now to things that, that long ago were demonstrated to be improper, wrong, or harmful. And so these people in the last days are already being groomed to reject the truth of the gospel. We see it right now when you speak to people about the Lord Jesus Christ and they want to argue with you about the Bible or argue with you about who Jesus is or whether he ever existed and things of that nature. You already see that taking place. These people in the very last days are going to refuse to receive, he says, a love of the truth. 
They have no appetite for it. They have no desire for it. It's not something they want. What they prefer is the, the lies of the world. They have no desire for the truth of the gospel. So the message of the gospel, which is called the word of truth, will be rejected. Again, what we have today is, is a propaganda that is really effective. All the way back when I was a kid in, in elementary school, couldn't have been more than nine, maybe ten at the most. I still remember one of our teachers, as she was teaching us concerning propaganda, I still remember some of the lesson. How that she said that the way for people to begin to believe something, she said in every commercial and every advertisement has this, and this is the way certain philosophies spread, she said it's just to have people who say something and others who repeat it, and when it's repeated enough times, it becomes common truth, and when it becomes common truth, people accept it without even looking at it thoroughly. She said that's called propaganda. She says it happens every time you watch a commercial, every time you read an ad, every time somebody is saying something and if it can be repeated by somebody else, well-known people can actually bring their way of thinking upon an entire nation just by repeating lies and making it seem like it's true. So when we reject the truth, we're open to the lie. And that's what's going to take place in the last days when Antichrist is making his, himself seen on the face of the planet. The message of the gospel, though, we believers know is called the message of truth. It's the word of truth. When Paul was writing the Ephesians in chapter 1, verse 13, he told them, In him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. And so those who are to be eternally lost are those who reject revealed truth. Verse 10 says, again, with all unrighteous deception among those who perish, they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. So again, he's speaking of what's taking place in the last days as the Antichrist is making his, his, his presence known on earth. Now, Paul has been writing on this particular subject, and he pointed out that a figure is going to be ruling during what is called a seven-year period or a seven-year tribulation, and this one is best known by us as Antichrist. And during that time, many false teachers will be turning people to the Antichrist. Now, Jesus in Matthew 24, 11 had said, many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. In Matthew 24, verse 24, he went on to say, false Christs and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. Revelation 13, verse 12 says that Antichrist's false prophet makes the earth worship Antichrist, worship the beast, and people will listen to the lies of the beast and they will worship him. Now, Following after lies and deception is not a new thing, and it's not uncommon. It's something in the history of Israel that happened early in its days. Jeremiah, one of the prophets of, of Israel, said in chapter 14, verse 14, that the Lord said to me, the prophets are prophesying lies in my name. I haven't sent them or appointed them or spoken to them. They're prophesying to you false visions, divinations, idolatries and the delusions of their own minds. Well, this Antichrist will have a false prophet who's giving a false message, but also, according to verse 9, the coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with power, signs, and lying wonders. And so, instead of believing the message of Christ, they're going to believe the lie, and a lot of it has to do with the proclamation of, of the, the false prophet as well as the miracles that these people are going to see, and then they're going to believe what is called the lie. Notice verse 11, for this reason God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie. So all of these things are working together. So instead of, of uh, receiving Christ, they receive what is called the lie. Through the promptings of the false prophet, Antichrist will be believed in. And the lie is that Antichrist is Messiah and you don't need Jesus Christ. That's the lie. So in, instead of receiving, they reject. When they reject the gospel, they reject the God of the gospel. They reject Jesus. 
So the rejection comes because they didn't receive, nor did they ever love the truth. Instead, they listened to the words of the false prophets. Again, that reminds me of something that the prophet Isaiah said when he said, uh, Isaiah 30, verses 9 and 10, this is a rebellious people, lying children, children who will not hear the law of the Lord, who say to the seers, do not seek, to the prophets, do not prophesy to us right things, speak to us smooth things, prophesy to us, prophesy deceit. Again in Jeremiah, Jeremiah prophesied concerning the people's openness to deception. Jeremiah 23, 16 and 17, thus says the Lord of hosts, do not listen to the words of the prophets who prophesy to you. They make you worthless. They speak a vision of their own heart, not from the mouth of the Lord. They continually say to those who despise me, the Lord has said, you shall have peace. To everyone who walks according to the dictates of his own heart, they say, no evil shall come upon you. Well, instead of receiving truth, they receive the lie. The lie is that Antichrist is true Messiah, and instead of embracing Jesus, they voluntarily will embrace the Antichrist. And the result is their condemnation. Why? Because they said they had pleasure in unrighteousness. They embrace unrighteousness. When it says that they embrace unrighteousness, this would be speaking not only of the way that they're living, but the, uh, <clears throat> the teachings of Antichrist and the claims of Antichrist. So God is going to permit strong delusion to occupy their minds, and they will believe the lie. They do prefer false apostles. They do prefer their lies over the truth of the gospel. So being ready to receive any false Messiah, they reject the true one. Why do they do that? Well, Jesus in John 3.19, the scripture says in John 3.19, this is the condemnation that the light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. The Thessalonians have embraced the gospel, and Paul is obligated to give thanks. And in this giving of thanks, there's an encouragement given to believers. Now notice how he begins in verse 13. He says, We are bound to give thanks to God always for you, brethren, beloved by the Lord, because God from the beginning chose you for salvation through the sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. Out of God's abundant love, God has chosen you for himself. Remember always that whatever God does for the lost finds its origin in his love for them. And remember that the foundation of salvation is the love of God, the love that God has for man and woman. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God loved the world and gave his son. In Jeremiah, in the Old Testament, once again, chapter 31, verse 3, we read, The Lord has appeared of old to me, saying, Yes, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness, I have drawn you. John, in 1 John 4, 19, said it like this, the Apostle John said, we love him because he first loved us. So God's love is revealed through his grace and his mercy towards sinners. God demonstrated his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, Paul says in Romans 5, verse 8. And this grace and mercy is revealed through the gospel of truth. In 1 John 4 and 9, this is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. So salvation isn't possible for those who refuse the love of the truth. What is the truth? The truth is Jesus. He is truth and it's revealed. He's, he is revealed in the gospel message. So re receiving his truth produces hope and it prepares us for heaven. Colossians chapter 1 verse 5 speaks of the hope which is laid up for you in heaven of which you heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel. And so Paul is calling them beloved, and he's reminding them that God has chosen them. Again, remember, they thought they missed the rapture, but Paul is reminding them of their salvation, and this is to give them peace in the midst of their afflictions. Now, there are those who think that the direction, pointing people to heaven, the direction of heaven, they, they think that that kind of counsel when someone goes through a hard time or is struggling, 
They think that kind of counsel is irresponsible. Sometimes they'll say it's even unloving. Why would you try to comfort somebody with promises of pie in the sky by and by? Well, the fact is that all believers over all time have found comfort in the promises of God. It's what strengthens us in our daily journey. This world is not our home, and we need to understand that. How do you comfort people who are at a time of loss? How do you bring that about? When I was a, a young pastor, the very first funeral I ever did, I was about 28 or 29 years old. It was at least seven months ago. <laughs> and I was a young man, about 28 years old, no older than 29, but I believe I was 28. The very first funeral I ever did was the funeral of an unbeliever, a man who was a pedophile, an alcoholic, and addicted to drugs. And a member of our church had asked me to perform the service for her father, a man that I just referred to in that way. And that's what he was. I'm a young man. I come walking into a funeral parlor it's a, small, it's a small building, and as I'm looking out, there are all kinds of people that I had only heard about but never seen in person. They were people, it, it, frankly, and I don't mean this in a humorous way, but the way it affected me, they looked like people out of a, an old movie. You know, they were dressed in a certain way, and, and, and it turns out that, that this man's, all of his friends were, were gamblers, all of them. And, and they had a certain look to him. And, and not only that, but his, his, the lady friends he had were prostitutes. And so we had a group of alcoholics, uh, people who performed a lot of different sins, including prostitution. And, and how did I know they were prostitutes? Well, because they were wearing, many of them had red dresses. Now, when I grew up, now, you got to put yourself way back. This is a history lesson for a second. But when I grew up, my mama used to refer to prostitutes in a certain way. She'd say, some of you may be old enough or maybe you heard it. They'd say, ladies in red. How many of you have ever even heard that term? Am I teaching you? Yeah, see, see, I'm not lying. I'm telling you the truth. There's some ladies in red right here. No. Uh, <laughs> but they were called ladies in red. That's what they were called. And I, I thought that was just a phrase, ladies in red. There were these ladies all dressed in red. They were prostitutes. Their hair was platinum blonde from being bleached. Their lips were bright red. And I'm looking out there, I'm thinking, my goodness, I'm 28, 29 years old. I, I have never seen this before. How do you bring comfort in that situation? How do you do that? You give them the gospel. You give them the truth of the gospel, which is what I did. I preached to them the gospel of Jesus Christ, the only thing that could change their life and save them. That's what you do. My second funeral, there was a young man, I used to play softball in the early days, and he was on the team. And I didn't know that I spoke highly of my wife at that time. I didn't realize that. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And he spoke to me one day and he said, you know how much you love your wife? And I smiled at him because I didn't realize that he had gotten that from me. I smiled at him. He goes, that's how much I love my wife. He says, I love my wife with all of my heart. And I thought that was very sweet and very dear because you don't see a lot of men that age. He was in his early 20s talking like that about his wife. And I smiled at him and I said, well, that's wonderful. Well, his wife had gotten a job. She was working nights. She met a guy. She committed adultery, and he killed himself. They found him hanging in his garage. That was my second funeral, my second funeral. The first one was for the man I mentioned. The second was for a young man who had lost all hope and all reason in his sight to live. How do you reach people who are broken? You give them the gospel. It's the gospel of hope. And that's what you do in funerals and all. And then, many years ago now, there was a terrible thing that happened in our, in our area. Uh, a young man and his girlfriend, high schoolers, had gotten in an argument. 
And uh, the young man just drove away from the young lady's house, and, and the young lady was unfinished with what she had to say. And so she got in her car and began chasing him on Riverside Drive over here in Ontario. And as she was speeding to try and catch him, she started passing cars to catch him and drove head on into a, a van with a young mother and her two babies. And they all died instantly. And so I was asked to please do the funeral for this young lady. And I still remember going to the, the place that I was doing the funeral, and it was all high school students because she was a high schooler in the local area. And I had my notes before me. I began to share some of the things. And as I looked out, you could see the kids, the young people. You know, this is a heavy thing for them. They don't know how to deal with this kind of thing. And so they're kind of talking and, and kind of moving around. And, and they're not listening to what I'm saying. And I still remember closing my notes and just speaking from my heart to them and sharing with them. This is what happened, this is what happens, and this is what the solution is. And I began to share with them from my heart. I said, listen, I'm not going to speak to you from the notes I prepared for this funeral, but let me share with you something you may not hear anywhere else. I shared the gospel with them and closed. Several years later, I was here in, the, um, in our chapel giving a study, and a woman approaches me afterwards because I had just used that as a story. I used it as part of a message, what had happened. And this young woman approaches me and she says, you didn't finish the story. Let me tell you the rest of the story. And I looked at her and I said, okay. She says, the young man that was being chased was my brother. His girlfriend was chasing him when it happened. What you didn't know is that he got saved at that funeral when you gave that message. And so how do you deal with loss is you point them to hope. How do you deal with pain? You point them to heaven. Why? Because we're just passing through. There's something deeper, and that's what we do. We, we are, the Bible calls us sojourners and pilgrims. In 1 Peter 2.11, he said, Beloved, I beg you, as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. You see, for us, the world is not our home. We're on our way to heaven. Philippians 3.20 says our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. So believers are given spiritual security by receiving and loving the gospel, the word of truth. It's something that Paul made very clear that he might be saying, this is something to encourage you. And the security we have in Christ is, that, is what prompts us uh, to live for Christ. And it's the security in Christ that they have that prompts Paul to thank God for them. They had received the truth of the gospel. And because they've received the truth, they reject what is a lie. Now notice in verse 13, he said, God chose them from the beginning, from from eternity for salvation. Salvation isn't an afterthought with God. He intended to save them. In 1 Peter 1, 18 through 20, it says, you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish, without spot, he indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. So this began with God choosing them in the past. It continues into their future. And the way of salvation is by the work of the Holy Spirit in combination with the pro proclamation of the gospel. He says that God, in verse 13, chose you for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit. So it's God's Holy Spirit leading you to salvation in Christ. In John 16, verse 8, Jesus, speaking of the Holy Spirit, said when he has come, he will convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. It's the Holy Spirit who draws us through the combination of the preaching of the word and the sense of conviction that we have as we listen to it and say, this is truth and I need to embrace it by faith. And that's what he's saying. It's through sanctification by the Spirit and belief of the truth. So God's purpose is for us to live in holiness, and the holiness comes through the work of the Holy Spirit and the Word of God. 
And it's an inward process, and, and it's produced through the prompting of the Spirit. The prompting of my flesh will always be to go against the will of God. You will always know it's your flesh when you're being prompted to do something that you know God is not in favor of. That's your flesh. But to do something that he's pleased with, that's the prompting of the Holy Spirit. Because your flesh does not want to please God. Your flesh is at warfare constantly with God. Wants nothing to do with it. It's the Holy Spirit who's saying to you, you need to do this. And he's the one who opens up your eyes to the truth of that and gives you the ability to perform that which you desire. It's an inward process. And it's the Spirit who prompts you to desire. And God's Word shows you what it is he wants you to do. And that's why your life can be such a testimony. And it doesn't matter how old you are. Sometimes you may be an old person and you tell people, younger people about Jesus, and they'll look at you and they'll say, yeah, you follow Jesus because you're too old to do any more sinning. You know, for you staying up late and partying is watching the news at eight. But how about me? I want to go out and party all night long. Yeah, it's because you're just old. You're too old to sin. When I'm young, I got a life to live, right? I was 20 years old when my mom and dad came to faith in Christ. That's young because they saw how miserable I was prior to Christ and they saw the transformation when I committed myself to Christ and it was the transformed life that opened my eyes that God used to open the eyes of my dad and my mom to see that the gospel was true. Spurgeon, a great preacher of another day, said this. He said, the only real argument against the Bible is an unholy life. And there's truth to that. When you have somebody who claims to be a Christian and yet they're living as if they don't know him? Yeah, right. You believe. You believe. My sister Madeline, when I went into the army, I was 20 years old. My sister was 16. I went into the military. When I got out, I was talking to her. She's now 18, almost 19 at the time, and we're talking and I said, uh, so how did it go in school? Because I was shipped across. I was, in, I was in North Carolina, in Fort Bragg. So I asked her, I said, how, uh, how did it go in school? As a Jesus freak, you must have had great opportunity to share the gospel with your, your friends and all. And my sister Madeline at that time began to cry. And she said to me, David, she said, I failed. I failed at my, in my walk with Christ. I failed to live... It wasn't that she was very sinful, but she said, I just didn't take the opportunities when they were given to me to share with people about the goodness of the Lord. She says, and a lot of my friends are now, f at least my opportunity for a lot of my friends is over. I will never have the impact with them that I could have had had I been faithful to the Lord. And she said with tears, and she began to cry. I'll never forget that she was crying at my, my mom and dad's kitchen table, and she started to cry. And she said, I'll, I'm not going to ever... Do that again, David. I'm going to keep my faith in front, and I'm going to share with people about Jesus. And, and a short time after that, I began doing a home Bible study at my brother's house. And a young lady showed up at that Bible study by the name of Marie Lopez. And Marie Lopez didn't know the Lord. And she came, didn't come the next week, came the following week. And the following week, my sister Madeline sat down with Marie and brought her to faith in Christ. That's, why I'm, that's how I married, met and married the girl that I have today, is through a faithful young lady, my sister, who said, I will not resist telling people about Jesus ever again. And that's how, I, that's how we got together. And, and I was the answer to her prayers. LAUGHTER <laughs> Okay, I'll tell you a quick story. <laughs> Marie told me when we met, she said that when she was a little girl, her daddy was 82nd, I was 82nd, her daddy was 82nd. She said, when I was a little girl, I prayed that God would give me an 82nd veteran with green eyes who's a Mexican, and you came into my life. Yeah. So God answers prayer. She may not think that way now, <laughs> but she used to. She used to think that. Anyway, I'll get back to the Bible. That's more interesting. <laughs> so by believing what God says and acting upon it changes our lives. We are actually transformed 
Wherewithal shall the young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. Thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against you. We're transformed and purified by the word of God. And he says in verse 14 that he called you by our gospel for the obtaining of the glory. Now when he speaks of the gospel, it's, it's a gospel that he has partaken in of himself. And also he's mentioning those who are companions, Paul and uh, Silas and Timothy were traveling companions, and they had been used by the Lord to minister salvation. And it's the preaching and receiving of the message that enabled them to be saved. It's, it's like what it says in 1 Corinthians 1.18, the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but unto us who are being saved, it's the power of God. So God intended to save the Thessalonians, and he intends to save us through the preaching of the word of God. They had received the gospel. They had been walking before in spiritual darkness. The wisdom of their philosophers and intellectuals had produced no spiritual relief for them. You know, the philosophers, philosophy is a lover of, 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 uh, of, of wisdom. Uh, secular philosophers, uh, they can give you a lot of intellectual questions, pose uh, a lot of things that make you think, but they don't bring you spiritual relief. The gospel does. That's why we did not put our hope and trust in philosophy of man. Uh, we gave our, our, ourselves over through the power of the preaching of the gospel. Uh, 1 Corinthians 1.21, uh, the, for since in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom didn't know God, it pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. So to save them, God sent his son, and the gospel communicated this to them. Now, Notice in verse 13 how it said they've been saved through belief in the truth. It's not just listening to it, and it's not simply intellectually agreeing with it. It's in complete trusting and resting on the truth that saves you. And they had the blessing of being among the first to hear the gospel and to be saved. Also because they were saved, they would have a, a place of honor that comes from him as his children. So it's through the preaching of of the gospel that people are given the opportunity to be saved and in verse 14 it says that he says to which he called you by our gospel to obtaining the glory and that which in other words began in grace ends in glory God's spirit is working in every believer to deliver us from evil and to transform us and this also refers to the glory that we share with Jesus when we go to heaven now Jesus in John 17 22 spoke of of the glory that we would have when he said the glory which you gave me I have given them that they may be one just as we are so those who are in Christ share in the glory of Christ God's purpose is for believers to eternally share in and reflect the glory of Jesus Christ and that's why we want to walk worthy of the gospel for the Christian there can be no other glory in 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 12, Paul had said that you would walk worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. Therefore, he says, verse 15, Brethren, stand fast, hold the traditions which you were taught, whether by word or our epistle. Now, may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and our God and Father who has loved us and given us everlasting consolation and Good hope by grace, comfort your hearts, establish you in every good word and work. Stand fast, verse 15, stand fast, hold the traditions. The words stand fast, persist, persevere, keep on standing, remain firm. We've been saved by the gospel, stand fast and hold tightly to it. Like he said in, in 1 Corinthians 16, 13, he said, watch, stand fast in the faith. Be brave, be strong. Galatians 5, 1, stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free. Don't be entangled again with a yoke of bondage. So in light of the fact that the world crisis is coming, he says, stand fast in God's word. Do not be shaken in mind. Do not be troubled do not get apathetic. Clutch tightly to the truth that you've received from us. And he uses the word tradition. That speaks of instruction. It speaks of a narrative. It's, it's not speaking of religious ideas. 
When he speaks of the traditions, he's speaking of the gospel that had been verbally delivered, later was written for them. So he's saying, hold fast to our teaching, the teachings of the apostles or apostolic doctrine. Hold fast in the things that you've heard. Remain firm in God's word. And this is what has given you freedom in life. And the teachings of the apostles are the teachings that they had personally received. In Galatians 1, 11 and 12, he says, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, the gospel I preach is not of human origin. I didn't receive it from any man, nor was I taught it. Rather, I received it by revelation from Jesus Christ. And because of that, stand fast. Do not move away from the grass, uh, away and grasp on to hold firmly to God's word. Hold your ground. Don't let go. Plant your feet. Clutch tightly to God's word. I haven't always been a, pu uh, a pastor in this pulpit. I was a college student. I went to school, secular college, where the professors seemed to have, take a delight, some of them, in trying to undermine our faith. And I didn't know, this guy's got a PhD, this guy's got a, this woman's got two masters and a doctorate. What do I know? But I knew one thing, once I was lost, now I'm found. I knew this, I knew Jesus Christ transforms life. I knew faith in God is, is, is what gives me hope and strength. I knew those things, and I was a young man. And yes, sometimes the professors, and indeed, some take a delight in undermining your faith, but I held fast and I stood strong. Why is that? Because it's truth, and I'm set free by it. My life has been transformed by the truth. And you need to have that attitude. You have to have that. It's something that you're called to. Don't let go. You see, the great apostasy, apostasy will, will impact those who refuse to hold on to apostolic doctrine. So I encourage you, read your Bible independently. Spend time in prayer and fellowship. Meditate on the Word of God. I encourage you, take opportunity when you have it to get involved in a Bible study Share your faith when given opportunity. Don't keep your mouth silent. The world is screaming while the church is quiet. We need to speak forth the truth. Hold fast to that which is true. Attend your Bible studies. Raise, for the parents, let me say it this way, raise your children in the faith of Jesus Christ. They are watching you. They are watching you. My kids watched me. My kids watched me. They watched their mom. They knew that I said something from a pulpit. Was I that in the house? You have to be that always, wherever you are. They need to see that it's true. What you believe is true. So read to them. Pray with them. Have devotions with them. When they're going through something, be sensitive enough to speak to them. Give them words of faith. Encourage them. Raise them in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ because if you don't teach them about Jesus, the world will teach you what he's not. You need to teach your children the truth. You have to because people today are saying, oh, you know what? It doesn't really matter as long as you believe. Believe what? Believe what? This little boy was sick many years ago. Mama went to the cabinet. It was dark. She opened it up, she put her hand in to get the medicine that had been prescribed for him, brought it, gave him a dose, put him to bed, and put him to sleep. And the next day found him dead in the bed. He had died because she had given to him, instead of the medicine, in her sleepy, groggy moment, she had gotten something called mercurochrome, which is a poison. She gave him poison without knowing it. She didn't intend to. She wouldn't have done that. But she did. And sometimes we give our children the idea that it doesn't matter what you believe as long as you believe something. And that's simply not true. There is one truth and many variations of lies concerning that truth. Give your children the truth every day. I've seen parents send their kids off to school. I've been there when I've seen it. Where they've said, good luck, have a good day. I never sent my children to school saying, good luck. I held them by the hand every day of their young life, and I prayed. I said, Jesus, in your name I pray, may they remember who you are. 
May they remember you as they go to school. They represent you. In Jesus' name, follow the Lord. I did that. And did they give me problems? Absolutely. Absolutely, my kids gave me problems. And I was mad at Marie for teaching them these bad things. But, you know, <laughs> she, she got better. She got better. They've got human nature. They're already moving against the things of God. It's part of their nature. That's why you fight for them every day. That's why when they go to bed, you kiss them, put your hand on their head, and you pray for them, Jesus, be with my baby every day, every day. They may depart for a series of time, for a short time, but the scripture says if we raise them up in the ways of the Lord, they will come back. And my children all had their season, but they all came back. That's the key. That's the key. Hold fast. Hold fast. And then finally, we'll close May our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who has loved us and given us everlasting consolation and good hope by grace, comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. Under persecution, may God give you encouragement. Stand fast in the word of God. God, hold fast to it. And may God encourage and establish you. Notice in every good word and work. If our lives contradict our preaching, the gospel is compromised, we lose credibility, and the gospel of transformation is undermined. So Paul prays that their word and their works will be consistent. Moody once said, the Bible was not given for our information, but for our transformation. So it is God's love that motivates our work for him. He has given us everlasting consolation and good hope by grace. He's our ever-present source of comfort, and so no persecution will take us from him. It's because he loves us and that he cares for us that he gave us his son. And so we can have, according to verse 16, good hope by grace. Not only does he comfort us, but he gives us deeper hope for the future. And by his grace, he imparts to us spiritual strength that's needed to endure the affliction. So he says, may God comfort your heart, verse 17, and establish you in every good word and work. As he comforts your heart, may he strengthen you within. That is the foundation of every good word, and that is the foundation of every good work. And it's the good works that are fueled by faith that testify of his saving grace. So walk worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And remember... This is not going to happen through your own efforts alone. The Holy Spirit is working within you as you continue to hold fast and live out the truth. Philippians 1.6 says it like this, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. So hold fast, don't let go, and one day you'll hear prayerfully, well done my good and my faithful servant. What could be greater than hearing that from the lips of Jesus Christ? Well done. Hold fast.